Hi, I hope you've been enjoying the second day of MDF's 2021 virtual conference. I'm Dr. Nadine Ann Skinner, the research coordinator at MDF, and it is my privilege to welcome you to this especially inspiring and helpful point in the conference where industry partners come together to share about their myotonic dystrophy programs and progress towards treatments and a cure. Now is a chance for us to hear directly from four partners about their approach, their process, and their progress. Today, we will hear from Nubase, PepGen, Arthex Biotech, and Expansion Therapeutics. In this virtual format, we have asked our speakers to record their presentations in advance so we can post to the NDF Digital Academy for others to watch after the conference. So we will not have the opportunity to ask the speakers questions during the session. However, many of our industry partners have exhibit booths which will be open for live chats tonight from 5 to 6 p.m. Pacific if you have follow-up questions. You can find their booths in the exhibitors tab on the menu bar of the conference website. Select conference exhibitors and click on the company you're interested in connecting with. Once you're on the company's page, there'll be a button that says join live showcase now. Click that button to join the conversation with that company. It is an exciting time with three clinical trials rolled out this year alone. Many thanks and enjoy the presentation. My name is Dietrich Steffen, and I'm the chairman and CEO of Nubase Therapeutics. Thank you for having us today. Nubase is a small biotechnology company that is planning to file its first IND to uniquely address the needs of those who are suffering needlessly with DM1. Our objective today is to communicate our approach and why we think that we potentially offer a unique option for patients uh, with DM1, but also to work collaboratively with the community, patients, physicians, KOLs, and foundations, so that we learn to do better and provide the best solutions that we possibly can. We're a group of scientists and clinicians, experienced drug developers who have brought genetic medicines forward into the marketplace in the past. And we're focused on a fresh new approach to such genetic medicines with Nubase. We have a platform, it's named the Patrol Platform, and it can output investigational therapies that look very much like traditional genetic medicines. For example, oligonucleotide therapies with a backbone and nucleobases arranged in the right sequence such that they engage a misbehaving gene and halt production of a protein, for example, that causes a disorder. In our case, though, the chemistry that we use appears to be very well tolerated, non-immunogenic, which, as you know, is important for lifelong chronic use and its ability to engage its genetic tar target appears to be heightened over traditional genetic medicines, which allows us to discriminate the misbehaving gene from the healthy gene, but also other sequences in the human genome and transcriptome that are highly similar. And that promises cleaner drugs at some future point. We are focused broadly on working to address uh, the needless suffering caused by monogenic disorders. But it's important to emphasize that myotonic dystrophy type one is the first indication that we as a company are going after. We plan to file our first IND as a company in the fourth quarter of 2022. And in the interim, we would very much enjoy staying connected to the community and learning. So what are the advantages of this unique platform uh, and this fresh approach that I've mentioned? The first is that we believe we might provide a whole body solution to patients. Obviously myotonia, uh, cardiac uh, conduction problems and cognitive deficits are hallmarks of the disease along with resp respiratory issues and some of the severe forms. And we've shown that we can deliver 
our investigational therapies to those tissues at active concentrations. And so we're optimistic that a convenient dose form, for example, subcutaneous routes of administration can get the therapy to where it needs to be to provide a whole body solution. Secondly, and we believe importantly, the target gene, which appears to be misbehaving, remains expressed in adult humans and appears to have function in, for example, heart and the brain. And so our approach is designed not to degrade that target misbehaving gene. Rather, we engage with it and fix the toxic effects of that um, gene such that we resolve uh, the causal insult. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that now. So as all of you know, just to set the stage for how our therapies work, DM1 is a dominantly inherited genetic disease where one copy of the DMPK gene has a trinucleotide expansion. And when that gene in the genome is transcribed into a pre-mRNA in the nucleus, it forms a hairpin structure, which is uh, aberrant. And that hairpin acts much like a magnet would to trap a type of protein called muscle blind, which is responsible for healthy processing or splicing of many RNA molecules in the cell. And that misplicing results in altered protein forms that cause the features of the disease that we're all familiar with. So our therapeutic approach, as you see on the right-hand uh, portion of this panel, uh, is actually designed not to degrade this pre-mRNA that's misfolded. Rather, our oligonucleotide invades into that hairpin structure and displaces the sequestered muscle blind. So those proteins can go do what they're supposed to do. Correct splicing and correct protein uh, function downstream. Now, again, key here is that we resolve the characteristic splicing uh, problems in uh, patient tissues uh, as we've modeled by uh, transgenic animal uh, systems. Um, but we also believe not only do we not degrade this DMPK mRNA, but we actually uh, believe that we release it into the cytoplasm to be translated and form a healthy complement of DMPK protein downstream. Now I'll mention animal models who have complete loss of function of DMPK do manifest a phenotype. And there's a, a set of papers in the literature uh, that you can go um, search on PubMed that'll speak to this. Um, but for example, there appear to be uh, problems with actin cytoskeleton remodeling in neurons in the brain, which lead to um, problems with long-term potentiation. And it's hypothesized that that might, um, you know, um, undergird some of the cognitive deficits. And, and if that's the case, uh, driving DMPK protein levels to zero with a degrading therapy may not be the best solution. So, uh, we're hopeful that our therapies maintain the MPK protein. Okay, and I'll illustrate that here for you. So in cells derived from patients who are suffering from DM1, grown in a dish in tissue culture, um, those cells uh, appear to overexpress the DMPK mRNA as illustrated in blue in the left-hand panel. And that's because the cell sees it's not making enough DMPK protein and it drives expression of that DNA locus up aberrantly. So after dosing with our compound in cells, uh, what we see is a relaxation of that characteristic overexpression back to baseline levels of healthy human cells. So we see this as a normalization of classic overexpression, likely because we're now allowing DMPK um, mRNAs to escape into the cytoplasm and be translated. Thereafter, using the established animal model of myotonic dystrophy type 1, the HSA-LR animal, 
we illustrated that a single intravenous dose of one of our investigational therapies uh, rescues the characteristic splicing uh, illustrated in pink relative to blue, which is misplacing. And it does so at an early time point. This is approximately two weeks after single dose IV administration. Um, approximately 60% of all of the misspliced transcripts are corrected at this point in time. And when we go further and ask, can we do the same thing with subcutaneous injection at even lower doses, but now measure functional rescue uh, by looking at reduction in myotonia itself as a result of correction of splicing and correction of downstream protein production, what we see here uh, is that we do uh, achieve statistically significant rescue uh, of um, myotonia uh, after subcutaneous injection of three mg per kg doses uh, relative to healthy animals who have no myotonia. So this forms the pharmacology package that's uh, giving us confidence in moving forward towards an IND filing. And in the background, we're scaling up our manufacturing capabilities of this first in class uh, medicine um, and uh, uh, initiating non-clinical toxicology um, such that um, our IND enabling package is ready for submission in Q4 of next year. So, Hopefully I gave you a sense of um, what we're as a company doing uh, to hopefully provide um, you know, another opportunity for patients uh, in the clinic in the short term. Uh, one uh, which we believe may be well tolerated, um, may preserve uh, DMPK proteins, which we feel uh, could be important for patients and one which may allow a whole body solution. Please do uh, uh, stay connected to us. We would very much enjoy building relationships with the community, again, for the purpose of learning so that we can do the best job that we possibly can do uh, for those who are suffering. So thank you so much and um, look forward to connecting offline. Hello, my name is Beatriz Yamusil. I am the CEO of Artex Biotech, a spin-off company of the University of Valencia that is dedicated to the development of antimicrobial oligonucleotides to treat mitotic tissue patients. Let me introduce you my team. Um, we are a small team and we have a dedicated lab in the University of Valencia, some people helping me at the management level. And in the board of directors, I should mention two VCs on board in Vivo Capital uh, and at the France. And as part of our scientific advisory board, we have um, international experts in the synthesis of oligonucleotides and the design of antisense molecules, such as Ramon Erizia and Eric Marcusum, and two clinicians uh, which are very well known in the field of mitotic dystrophy, Nicholas Johnson and Guillaume Basset. The company was created at the end of 2019, but I was personally involved in the research against mitotic dystrophy since um, 2007, when I initiated my first postdoctoral stay in the University of Valencia. About the disease, you probably all know more than myself. Um, just to let you know that although it is considered a rare genetic multisystemic disease, it is still highly prevalent. It is in fact the most common muscle atrophy in the adults. And there is no uh, dedicated treatment, although the genetic cause is very well known. It is a very complex disease from the genetic point of view, but just to make it short, um, it is um, generated by a mutation in the DMPK gene, in the case of DM1, um, which is causing a toxic RNA because this extra long RNA, it's folding into a herpin here in purple that is retaining MBNL proteins. And these MBNL proteins are important regulators of splicing that when, when they are retained here, there is a lack of function of these proteins that is originating part of the symptoms. And it has been reported in several models of the disease that the will expression of this protein could be therapeutic. So um, our approach was to generate a first-in-class RNA therapy for the treatment of this disease based on upregulating the levels of uh, MBNL proteins. Um, 
as you know, most of the companies are focused um, on this part of the problem. They are trying to um, decrease or inhibit the interaction between the protein and the RNA or directly destroy this toxic RNA. But studying mRNA proteins, we have discovered that the levels of this protein are uh, downregulated by two different mechanisms. They are attached to the repeats, but they are also blocked by um, microRNAs that are inhibiting, inhibiting the production of this protein. These microRNAs, MIR-23B and MIR-218, we observe them upregulated in muscle biopsies and also in different models of the disease, and they are blocking the production of mRNA. So what we have discovered is that um, just blocking these uh, microRNAs, we could increase the general levels of the protein enough to see a relief of the symptoms. So although we, we will still have some protein attached to the foci or to the toxic RNA, there will be a general upregulation of the protein, so there, are more, there is more protein available to perform its function. To block these microRNAs, we used antimers that are single-stranded RNA. And we obtained proof of concept of this therapeutic approach in two uh, papers already published and one that is about to, to be published, um, where um, subcutaneous injections of these molecules uh, produce a long-acting therapeutic effect in a well-known mouse model of the disease. So although the results with these antimers were promising, um, during the last year, we have put a lot of effort in improving the efficacy of these antimers and finding the best molecules to move into the clinics. Um, this is the screening we performed. We started with more than 100 different antimers, which were naked molecules or molecules uh, with different hydrophobic, conjugated to different hydrophobic moieties to improve their effects into the muscle tissues. Um, we started with the screening in vitro and then we moved to in vivo using the HSALR mice. So we first tested the molecules at a very high concentration uh, to get rid of those that can be toxic. And then we tested them at a, at a reduced concentration at just three mg per K to um, only observe an effect in those that are highly efficacious. Uh, with these results, we selected two candidates, one molecule against MIR-218, which is our main lead, and another backup against 218 um, that we will move forward just in case, uh, just in the case uh, that we observed any toxicity with the, with the previous, um, with the first molecule with the lead against 23. Um, just to show you the comparison of the um, uh, new molecules with the previous ones, these are the, the molecules that we have uh, previously published, these antimers conjugated to cholesterol. With these molecules um, injected at 40 mg per K, we obtained a normalization of the strength in the mice model <clears throat> and a decrease in the myotonia of up to 50% maximum. However, with the new molecules, I show you here some uh, the effect of some of the new molecules in the myotonia and in the in, uh, percentage of force of the mice. Um, as you can see with the lead candidates that I have encircled here in red, uh, the one against 23B and in green, the one against 218, with these two leads just injected at three mix per K, we obtain even better results than with the previous molecules injected at 40. Here you can see a decrease in the myotonia of up to 75% and also a normalization in the strength. So the new molecules are at least tenfold more efficacious than the previous ones. Um, testing the effects of antimers in uh, human cells, we perform RNA sex studies. And um, you can observe here a group of uh, splicings that are altered when we compare to control and DM1 cells, uh, myoblast. Um, when we treated DM1, uh, myoblast with antimir 23b as you can see there is no longer um, points in some of these effects which means that there is no longer difference between the control condition and the uh, dm1 treated that that means that we are normalizing all these uh, splicings and improving the effects in some of them um, when we um, compare these results we obtain with the cells with um, the um, data uh, previously published by Wang regarding the alterations in the uh, 
different myopsy from muscles uh, from muscles of patients. Um, what we observed is that our antimers could rescue about 85% of these splicings that were commonly altered between DM1 cells and biopsies in humans. Um, we have also some data with this um, with the lead against 23B in rats. We injected this compound um, once weekly in uh, during three weeks in rats at two different concentrations, eight mg per k and 30 mg per k. And we have observed that there is, um, looking at the gastronomous muscles of these uh, rats, we observed that there is a strong upregulation of MBNL protein. Uh, after these three weeks of treatment, that we, we really have five fold of protein. Already with the lowest dose, we obtained a very strong upregulation of the protein. We have also tested the difference between intravenous and subcutaneous uh, pathways or routes of administration. And as you can see with both of them, um, here only after one injection, um, there was no difference. So subcutaneous could be also uh, an option for this treatment. And looking at the effects in time after just one single injection, one day after the injection, we had levels uh, of the protein of MBNL1 protein of more than twofold. There was a peak after five days, but still after 22 days, we still see around threefold of protein in the muscles of the rats, which means that our molecule has a strong effect in, in the muscles. Um, we quantified the levels of the molecule uh, at these time points in the, in the rats, and we observed that we were uh, in the low nanomolar range. We, we even needed to, to test different bioanalytical methods because we were not able to detect them up below um, 50 nanogram milliliters. So that means that we only need small amounts of this compound in the muscles to have a strong effect on MBNL proteins, which has been directly linked to the link to the symptoms of the of the patients. Uh, so well, we are uh, moving this compound forward into the clinics, and, and this is our business model. We are right now in the preclinical non-GLP uh, in the preclinical uh, non-GLP phase, just initiating the preclinical regulatory phase that we will move forward within the next year. Probably we will be entering into the uh, first in human by the end of 2022. And our idea is to perform a phase one, two, A um, um, during 23 and 24, and then go to phase two, three, uh, that could be registrational, uh, maybe, um, and maybe finish at um, during 2027. Um, ideally, we will be initiating treatments against other indications also during this uh, next year, and we will also focus in the field of rare neuromuscular diseases. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the uh, rest of the talks. Hi, I'm really excited to be here with you at the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation virtual conference. And I'm really excited to share with you today some of the work that we've been doing at PEPGEN to develop a new therapy for myotonic dystrophy type 1. Our therapies are oligonucleotide therapies, and I'll tell you more about what that means in a moment. And I am personally really excited about this technology. My name is Jane Larkendale, and I'm the Vice President of Clinical Sciences at PEPGEN. I've been with PEPGEN for about six months now, having spent most of most of my career to date working in the nonprofit, on the nonprofit side, really working towards accelerating drug development for rare diseases, particularly neuromuscular diseases. After many years at the Muscular Dystrophy Association, Friedrich's Ataxia Research Alliance, and most recently at Critical Path Institute. I decided to join PEPGEN because I'm so excited about the technology that we're developing, and I think it really can impact patients with a wide range of neuromuscular diseases, including myotonic dystrophy. Our company is a relatively new company. We were launched out of technology that was developed at the University of Oxford and the University of Cambridge in the UK, and really have been working slowly toward, towards clinical, um, clinical compounds. 
At the end of last year, we announced a, a Series A funding round, and we just announced a Series B funding round of 112.5 million, which will allow us to get our, our lead candidates from um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and myotonic dystrophy into the clinic and for first trials and patients. This is really exciting. I'm not going to go through the slide to introduce all of my amazing colleagues here at, at Petgen. This is our leadership team, all of which shares my excitement about, about this technology and a dedication to getting efficacious, patient, uh, efficacious treatments to patients. Because everything we do is about working with the community that have these diseases and producing therapies that will actually work for them. So what is our therapy? And what is our platform? Our platform is really to do with how we deliver these oligonucleotide therapies. Oligonucleotide therapies, a form of precision medicine that's been around for some time. The first oligonucleotide therapies have been approved and are available to patients with various diseases. But the challenge with oligonucleotides is they don't um, get delivered very well, particularly into skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. You can treat, uh, treat a cell with them, they work really well, but when you treat a person or an animal with them, just not very much gets to the cells where, where they need to work. And that's what we have done with this technology um, out of Oxford and Cambridge, is developed a way of getting these oligonucleotides very effectively into particularly skeletal and cardiac muscle. We're a very dedicated team. We're working towards getting, um, getting our first therapy into patients in Q1 of 2022. That will be in, um, be in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but we'll follow in 2023 with our first clinical program in myotonic dystrophy. So this slide really just illustrates what we, what we have. This oligonucleotide is that, um, that well-established technology that um, for, uh, really works on a defective gene um, to form a, a precision therapy. And this is peptide, which is what's come out of years and years of work at Oxford and Cambridge, has been optimized to really push that oligonucleotide into the cell where it will work without causing toxic side effects. And we're really excited about this. This is data from one of our first studies. It's in a non-human primate. They were, they were treated just once. And seven days later, we looked at how much of that PMO, that's the oligonucleotide, has gotten to key tissue types. And this is really exciting for, for myotonic dystrophy because not only did we get a lot of oligonucleotide into skeletal muscles, you can see there's a dose dependency. The more we give, the more that gets in. We also get a lot of oligonucleotide to heart. And we know that myotonic dystrophy is characterized by cardiac symptoms of many patients. We also get into smooth muscle like the gut and the esophagus. Again, we, know, we recognize in myotonic dystrophy, these are systems that are affected by disease. And perhaps if we can get the oligonucleotide into them, we will see an effect on those symptoms. And intriguingly, we also get some oligonucleotide into the brain. This is the cerebral cortex, this is the cerebellum. The levels are certainly much lower than in the muscle tissues, but we are getting some there, which leaves the possibility we may be able to affect other symptoms of myotonic dystrophy as well. This is perhaps what's most exciting about, the, about this platform for me. Now, I don't think I need to explain to this audience what causes myotonic dystrophy. You have a repeat sequence that's um, in the DMPK gene. This is obviously for uh, myotonic dy dystrophy type one. That repeat sequence binds a protein called muscle blind, and that causes downstream effects. That means that other genes and other proteins are not processed properly and they don't work the way they should. But that's without treatment. What does our treatment do? It binds to this long repeat in the, um, in the RNA, preventing the binding of muscle blind. That frees up the muscle blind to go and do what it needs to do so the proteins and RNAs are all processed appropriately. But also it leaves the DMPK um, there. We don't knock down DMPK and that allows that to continue its function as well. So that's what we're trying to do with EDODM1. We obviously had to test it. We tested it in a mouse model called the HSA mouse model. This has the same repeat sequence. It's not in the same gene, but it has the same phenotypes in the skeletal muscle only, um, as you see in DM1. So you get the expression of the, of the repeat. You get the muscle blind binding, so it's not available. We get the splicing events. That's the downstream processing of, of other RNAs. And you see myotonia. And that... Those are all things we can look at and see if our drug can correct. First of all, this is a, again a mouse, a single injection 14 days later, the oligonucleotide is getting into the muscle. This mouse only expresses um, the repeat in the muscles. So we couldn't look at other tissues, but we're getting a dose dependent increase um, in oligo in the muscle. 
perhaps more excitingly, we're seeing correction of this misplacing, this misprocessing of other RNAs. So if you look in this first example, this is the wild type mouse, it's set to 100% exon 22 inclusion. In the mouse model, that drops enormously. But as you add more and more drug, it reverts to the wild type 100% splicing and can go about its business normally and do whatever that gene it needs to do. This is a different gene. In this case, wild type um, splices this out completely. In the mouse model, it doesn't. Again, a dose-dependent increase in the splicing goes back pretty close to what you'd see in an unaffected mouse. So this is great. We can see the downstream effects of that repeat going away. This is perhaps even more exciting. This is myotonia, that contraction of the muscle that doesn't relax. You can see um, low levels in the wild type mouse. Um, without treatment, this gets higher. And again, a dose dependent correction. So we see complete correction of myotonia at 30 mg per keg, single injection without treatment. This was an exciting result for us. He really convinced us that we should bring this, this forwards to patients. This was perhaps even more surprising and more exciting that after that single dose, we're seeing effects for up to 24 weeks, meaning we're not going to need to dose this too frequently. And we can probably increase the effect by um, additional doses if we need to. So we're really excited about bringing this forward for myotonic dystrophy patients. But this is only a mouse. We recognize this is only a mouse. We have a lot of data on non-human primates around the delivery, but we have not yet got a model of myotonic dystrophy that's greater than a mouse. But just to give you a visual of what this looks like, here is our HSA mouse. This is untreated on the left and treated on the right. And what you're gonna see here when I click on the button is as the mouse is released after a pinch, you can see its legs are my, um, have myotonia. They, they drag behind them, they can't contract. That's the untreated mouse. By comparison, if we look over here at the treated mouse, as soon as it's released, its legs are under it, it's running normally, and the myotonia is completely corrected. This is an exciting result. And if we can do this in, hu in humans and perhaps affect the other systems, we'll be really excited. But of course, this is drug development. There are two sides of developing every drug. One is, is efficacy, which we've just been talking about, and the other is safety. We have not finished the formal tox studies for EDODM1 at the moment, but our, our observations in rodents are that this is a very safe um, therapy. We've seen no real adverse events. The therapeutic doses are well tolerated. We have, don't impact body weight. We haven't seen any organ changes. We do have transient and reversible changes in blood chemistry at doses well above the therapeutic area, so more than we'd ever give a human, but nothing else has been observed at this time. With the caveat, we still need to do the formal talks. So all of this makes us really excited about this technology, at least in mouse studies and also in human cells, what we've seen is encouraging that we may have the effect we want. Um, reducing DMPK binding, fixing uh, muscle blind binding, fixing the um, splicing, fixing the myotonia. This is all really encouraging. We hope to be in the clinic in Q1 of 2023 with this program. We have, a, have, um, have one program in Duchenne that will be ahead of that, which will inform us greatly on the delivery of these oligonucleotides. So we believe we have a, have a breakthrough in delivery of this kind of therapy, which really has the potential to transform disease for people with myotonic dystrophy. I would be remiss not to acknowledge and thank our collaborators at the Institute of Myology in Paris, Dr. Dennis Ferling and Dr. Arnaud Klein, who have done a lot of the animal experiments for us. Um, if, you would, if you have any questions or comments, please send me an email. My email address is on the screen. We are relatively new to the myotonic dystrophy space as a company, although I've been working on myotonic dystrophy for um, a number of years, well, really for the last 20 years, to be honest. I would love to hear from the community about what you need from a therapy, how we can help you, and what you'd, you would like to tell us about your disease. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much to the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation for running this meeting. And I look forward to hearing from you, from you all as we develop this really exciting therapy, therapy for myotonic dystrophy disease patients. And I really would love your input. Thank you. Hi there, everybody. My name is Valerie Cullen. I'm the Senior Vice President of Research at Expansion Therapeutics. And I'm very honored to speak with you today at the MDF virtual conference. And I certainly hope that next year we'll be able to meet in person. I'd like to take a few minutes of your time to update you on what Expansion Therapeutics has been doing 
in its research to find a new medicine for DM1 patients. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you and show you some of our latest data. So in case you don't know who Expansion Therapeutics is, we're a, a, a small company. We were founded three years ago, coming out of the laboratory of Professor Matt Disney at Scripps, Florida. And we were founded with the express intention of developing drugs that can directly bind to RNA and therefore provide a benefit to patients who are suffering from an RNA mediated disease. And we wanted to be very ambitious about this and actually find small molecule drugs that would be orally available so that you could take it in a once or twice daily pill. And moreover, that they would cross the blood brain barrier and access the brain as well as the peripheral tissue like the muscle. So that is our goal. And how do we go about that? Well, we're working on the premise that if you can understand the 3D structure of RNA, then you'll be able to figure out a way to find a drug to bind to that RNA. So RNA is made from DNA and it's the middleman between DNA and protein. So RNA gets translated into protein. And we know that some RNAs are detrimental and therefore we, we might want to degrade those or inhibit the translation to the protein. And other RNAs are very beneficial. We don't have enough of that protein and we want to make more. And so in that case, we might want to stabilize the mRNA and activate its translation. So there's a lot of ways of thinking about drugging RNA. Now, specifically in the DM1 case, we know that DM1 is caused, as you know too, by a repeat CUG expansion in the DMPK gene. Hundreds or maybe even a thousand of these repeats, unfortunately. And so what does that do? Well, in practice, what's that, what that's doing is it's sequestering or gumming up, attracting a lot of this other protein called muscle blind. Muscle blind is a very important protein that regulates the splicing of hundreds of genes across the whole different organs of the body. And so if that muscle blind is kind of tied up, uh, bound to this toxic RNA, then it's not free to do it the rest of its job and it's not free to properly splice all those genes. And so what you end up with then are hundreds of genes that have been misspliced or misarranged. And therefore the proteins that they make don't work very well. And we know that DM1 patients have problems not just with their muscle, but with their heart, their brain and other systems too. And we're able to hone in and, and, and kind of identify the mRNAs or the, tr the transcripts that are being misspliced in the various tissues. So for example, in the heart or in the brain. And we think that they are causing some of the problems that I'm listing here on the left-hand side for DM1 patients. And so the idea is to, to bind to the RNA and liberate this muscle blind protein so that it's free then to go about its job and restore proper splicing to these genes. So a little bit of our data for you, not too much. Um, here we're showing that our, um, this, this is actually cells from a DM1 patient on the top row here. We're always very grateful for uh, cells and tissues that patients donate to research because it really helps us understand the disease. And here you can see a close-up of a cell in blue is the nucleus. And in red over here on the left, you can see all the RNA uh, aggregates or spots that have been aggregated together because of their long expansion repeat. And what that's also doing is it's causing this muscle blind protein, as I said a moment ago, to also clump up with some of that RNA in the same spot. When we then put one of our compounds on top of those cells, this is what we find. 
we find that there is much less RNA here clumping up. And as a consequence, there's less of the muscle blind clumping up as well. As you can see, if you compare this untreated one here to this nucleus down here from a cell treated with the drug. And we've actually run a number of our new drugs through this kind of assay, and we're showing a really nice reduction with lots of our compounds. So this is a real effect. This is a little bit of data then in an animal model. This is the mouse model of DM1 that Professor Thornton has made that's widely used in our community. And if you look first on the left, these are wild type animals or animals that don't have the expanded CUG. And they have a low CASI score. CASI means a missplicing score. So the, the worse missplicing you have, the higher your score. So you want a low score, which is what those healthy animals have. If you then look up here in the orange, you can see that the HSA animals, Professor Thornton's DM1 animals, when they're not treated with anything, they have a high score compared to the normal ones. So they have lots of misplicing of different genes. And then if you look over here in the pink, these are the same animals, but now they've been treated with our compound called 2036. And you can see that their score is much lower. So that means they're getting almost back to normal. All their misplicing that was going wrong is now being corrected and they don't have so much of a high score anymore on this, on this metric over here. So they're getting better, which is really promising. And if we look at another kind of uh, readout of, of that, we can look at the muscle of these animals. And specifically here, we're looking at a chloride ion channel that's very important for normal muscle strength. And what happens is that in DM1, uh, the, the particular ion channel here is so misspliced that it's sent down a degradation pathway and it's never even made. You can see there's a very, very, very low level of, of, of that protein compared to a wild type or normal animal here that has lots of nice protein around its muscle fibers. When we then treat this animal model, this DM1 mice with our compound, just in two weeks, we're able to show a complete restoration of those beautiful channels around each of the muscle fibers. And so we feel that this is a very promising visual sign of muscle strength being restored in these animals. And indeed, we feel that uh, these will be um, less myotonic. We can measure that by a simple pinch assay, and that's what we've shown. So the animals are better on a functional level as well. So we're going ahead and developing more and more of these compounds. Only one will get through all the tests that we do have to do. But in a nutshell, what we're doing is, as I said earlier, developing orally available small molecules, just like any other medicine that can go everywhere in your body, not just your muscle, but also your heart and your brain. We're doing that for DM1. We are using our understanding of RNA 3D structure to design the drugs. We found lots of hits at this point in time, and now we're optimizing them in order to find a lead drug. That would obviously be tested first for safety as well as efficacy in, in various animal models. Um, and then hopefully one day, maybe in about two years time, uh, be tested in the clinic. We already have a great uh, network of doctors that advise us. So hopefully we'll be able to set up a clinical study pretty efficiently when the time comes. And as I said, we want to help DM1 patients with all aspects of their disease across all their different tissue types. And we feel that this is a great approach for us to be able to try and do that. So I'd really like to thank you so much for coming to this talk today. Um, our website is under construction, but in a few weeks it will be up and running and you can go there and find lots more information about the company and about our work. And there's an email address here. If you have questions, I'll be available at other times during the presentations as well. 
So once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today. And I hope we're all successful in the quest to find new medicines for DM1. Thank you so much.